Hey everyone, Eric Thompson here. Hope that you are doing well. Welcome back to the channel as we consider, that's right, number 80, was it 85? Vegas will, <laughs> he'll fact check me if I'm wrong. But I think it's number 85. I should have just checked. Actually, I have I have all my notes here, but I don't suppose, uh, I don't suppose I actually wrote this down at any point, did I? No, I didn't. I'm a, I'm a fool. Anyway, it's mid '80s, 1935's *A Night at the Opera*. It's a Marx Brothers film. Okay, not Marxist. The Marx Brothers. Very enjoyable, very fun, uh, very light, and widely regarded as um, not only being uh, outrageous for its time, but also having one of the most important comedic scenes of them all, okay? Uh, here we are shooting in my car, so I'll watch people walk by and look at me weird because I'm talking to this camera that's wrapped around my steering wheel. You remember when we got that new camera, and so I, uh, <laughs> so I can wrap it around the steering wheel. Anyway, um, uh, suffice to say, A Night at the Opera is about <laughs> one night at the opera in particular that brings together uh, two of the main characters of the story, really the two protagonists. Groucho uh, owns uh, an opera company, um, but it's taken away from him, and so he has to find a way to win it back, okay, to get control of his opera company, and he does so uh, with the help of Chico Marx, who becomes the manager of an up-and-coming up opera singer, and through a very strange series of events, including, you know, traveling to Europe from New York and all of these things, um, eventually, uh, well, you know what I'm going to say, everything works itself out right as things do in the movies. Why is this movie on the top 100? Well, at least, of course, because of the Marx Brothers, who, what do we say? I mean... Is there an easy way to say how much they've given to the film uh, canon, you know, to the great canon of motion picture, motion, motion pictures, I'm sorry, I'm tired, I'm not thinking well. But um, there's no easy way to say, you know, how much they've contributed, um, not only through their comedy, but through their persons and their dedication to their craft. Even Groucho really tried to sustain his career later in life. It did not work out too well. Um, but of course, you know that like the Groucho glasses live on, and um, who said it? Alan Alda, I think, said that when he was doing his comedy like on Mash and stuff, and he was kind of vamping, he would always go back to stuff that that Groucho did. Um, Chico also in this film uh, really sort of reveals himself and his musical prowess. Um, a, a critic once said of Chico, he said. His, his repertoire is limited, but not his technique. All right, it's the other way around. His technique is limited, not his repertoire. Something like that. No matter which way you put it, it's it's quite a compliment. Um, you know, Chico was almost entirely self-taught, so I appreciate that, because I'm mostly self-taught as well, in the piano and the other things. Um, and it's something that I did not expect in this movie. And I'm not saying this is the reason why I should be on the top 100 necessarily, but uh, but you see the prowess of these three actors, these three brother actors coming out in this film. And I mentioned, of course, that one scene when they're in the, the stateroom and uh, two of them are kind of wheeled in in this, <laughs> this snuck aboard in this huge trunk. Of course, those big, you know, uh, uh, wardrobe trunks they had in that time. Um, and I, I really don't want to spoil it for anyone. If I can find it on YouTube, I'll provide a link to that scene in the description below. You guys check it out. It's it's really something precious and just so, so, so funny. And I mean, I just laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> Even though really compared to what we would say today, uh, the humor is quite bland. Um, but I think that's why the movie is relevant for today because it gives us a sense of where comedy has been and where it is going. Um, of course, this is not the first time in the AFI Top 100, and it certainly won't be the last when we have a chance to compare styles of comedy or, of course, styles of drama and action, uh, character development, sequence development, plot development, 
all these different things that have progressed so much over so much time. And here we are looking back, you know, 80 years almost, you know, to 1935 when film was in such a state of transformation. And so I think that's why this film is definitely relevant for today um, because we can, again, look back and see where comedy was and, and where it is now. And even though it, we want to say it's so different, really I think if we are honest, you know, we see so many of the same devices in effect. Um, I just, I just love comedies because they remind me of how important joy is in our lives. And that's where I see divinity in this film, where I encounter God in this film is in the laughter and in the joy. All over the Bible, and I'm going to turn to my notes again, you know, there's mention of laughing. And in some cases, we have laughing, and it's presented to us in a sort of, oh, <laughs> you know, uh, God laughs at his enemies uh, kind of thing. Um, and and I, I don't know if I like the wording there necessarily, because it makes, it gives the sense that, you know, uh, God is puffed up, <laughs> you know, uh, and that's not the sentiment the Bible wants to communicate, of course, but what really is in the spirit of that, um, for example, if I can just, uh, let's see if I find an easy one. Oh yeah, uh, Job, of course, who, you know, was uh, so terribly <laughs> afflicted in his life, uh, had no reason really to laugh, but here it is, Job five twenty two. You will laugh at violence and famine, and you will not be afraid of wild beasts. And then again, later on in Job, he will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouting. And so there we have those two different kinds of laughter. The one laughter that is a laughter at, at uh, adversary, you know, at adversaries, sort of a ha-ha, but not for the sake of pride or of uh, or of being proud, you know, which would lead to pride, but a laugh of confidence in God, because we know that God is greater than violence and famine and wild beasts, <laughs> and and so on and so forth. Again, in Job, referencing the Exodus, when she lifts herself on high, she laughs at the horse and the rider. Of course, from the story of the Exodus, um, you know, uh, horse and horse and chariot have been thrown into the sea when God defeated the Egyptians by, you know, drowning them all in the Red Sea. It's not that we laugh at their death or destruction, but we see them, we say, ah, you look what God has done um, in vanquishing our enemies in front of us. And yet, even aside from that, aside from the very real sense um, that we can laugh at our enemies, right? Um, Ecclesiastes, of course, um, that great passage on which the birds had their famous... Uh, uh, there is a season, turn, 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 you know, um, a, a time to weep and a time to laugh. And there is, uh, well, as you know, perhaps, how important laughter is and how good you feel after you laugh. And of course, the phys physiologists tell us about endorphins and all these things that happen in the body when you laugh. And, and I'm thinking also about, um, in, you know, in relationships, uh, as always, you know, at home or at work or uh, even personally, your your interpersonal relationship, your internal relationship with yourself, when you laugh and you have great joy and the release you feel from that, the way it lifts you up, not, again, just because of endorphins or whatever biological, chemical thing is happening in the body, um, because laughter is so separate from anxiety and grief and worry and stress. Um, isn't that a great stress relief to to just watch something funny. Uh, uh, my good friend Matthew, whom I love dearly, my, my co-worker, he's the youth minister here, we laugh every day we are in the office together. And I think, you can disagree, but I think, <laughs> it, uh, it helps us to work better. It certainly helps us, he and I, to work better together. And I mean, he'll call me over and we'll watch something, or I'll call him over and we'll watch something on YouTube or something like that, or I'll send him memes. We, we send each other back and forth a lot of memes and, and that kind of thing. And it's good. It, it, it's good. And not only that, but it, it gets us into conversation, you know, about what it is we're talking about. Um, and certainly, you know, to that very same end, um, I find with, with Tori, with my wife, that when we laugh together, um, we're at our very best. When we're laughing together and playing together, um, you know, we're not always laughing and playing. 
<laughs> but when we are, it's, it's so good for us. Um, and I can think of times when I've been upset with her or, or with myself or upset in general. And I want to brood and be like a five-year-old and the whole day goes by and I've just been a jerk. And, and then I just can't help it anymore. And we will watch something funny or she does something funny or I do something funny and, and I laugh and, and in that laughter and that release in that moment, I realize I was such a fool for being upset in the first place. And I, I really see how, how stupid I was <laughs> to be so selfish and so childish. Um, and that laughter gave me cause, gave me a moment to be able to realize that. Um, and so a night at the opera is just one of many reminders why laughter is so good for us, why joy is so good for us. You know, truth, truth be told, when I walked out here to the car <laughs> to film this review, I'm just feeling down. I'm tired. I've just not been sleeping well recently. And, um, and I was like, oh boy, you know, but I know I'm getting behind on the reviews and I got to, we got to pick up here quite a bit. Um, but now talking about laughter and laughing a little bit, you know, with you on camera and <laughs> realizing how silly I look sitting in the car here as all these cars are driving by <laughs> campus security. I'm sitting right across the street from the Georgetown campus here from the George H.W. Bush Center for Fitness. Uh, I feel better. You know, I got a meeting here in about 20 minutes and so I'm feeling a bit better about going into that meeting and contributing well and doing all of these things. And so, so that's good news, at least for me and maybe. <laughs> If nothing else, it was good for me to, to laugh a bit this afternoon, this evening. Um, so that's my little review on number 85, A Night at the Opera. Coming up, we have uh, some new things uh, and some very familiar things, okay? Um, Sunrise, which is, I think it's the oldest video on the AFI Top 100. And then right next to it uh, is Titanic. Wow. And so, uh, you know... I've not seen one. I didn't even know about Sunrise, and I have quite association with Titanic and a lot of feelings about that, a lot of thoughts about that. And so thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you care to on uh, the YouTube channel. We have some new folks to the channel, and so if you guys watch this, I want to welcome you and thank you for, for watching, for giving of your time to check out these videos. As always, feel free to share on Facebook or wherever else it is that you share. I, I want to talk about a couple things in the next video, okay? Ideas for the AFI Top 100 review, ideas for the channel in general. Um, I haven't done a top 10 video in like three or four months. Wondering if you guys want to see some more top 10 videos. I got lots of ideas on stuff to do. Um, but right now, I'm just trying to forge ahead with the AFI Top 100. Okay, enough of an outro. I always go on for too long. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <sighs> Thanks for watching. Take care, guys. Bye. Yeah.